Hi, this is Reg Atwal and welcome to our channel, our family business channel, where I've got the pleasure of interviewing another great guest for one of our shows, which is Family Business Legacies of someone who is either a next gen member or the founder of a family business, but it's a business that's going from one generation to the next, as well as doing some really other interesting things. So hopefully from today's entrepreneur, we can get some ideas, get some insights, get some wisdom that can help many other people move to the next stage. So my guest, very special guest, a lot of accolades. I would probably end up taking 10 minutes to do a full formal introduction but I'm gonna keep it brief so we can get into the interview. But Dr. Uchidana is a qualified medical practitioner who has transitioned successfully into a serial and seasoned entrepreneur and a business leader. She got an MD for AMU and also a full-time MBA from Stanford University. She's also received a PMP certification in public management and social innovation from Stanford University as well. She's a frequent speaker at various industry conferences around the world, and she also sits on several corporate and startup boards, including a group of companies, which is the family business in UAE, as well as many other startups, which I'll be asking her about. She's also being recognized in the Forbes Middle East as a next-gen business leader in the Arab world for three consecutive years. I don't know anyone else who's done that. 2017, 2018, again in 2019. She's also been recognized with Camden Wealth as a woman to watch in September 18 issue and also conferred with the Yuva Ratner Award in 2018. And last but not least, a couple of other great accolades, also with Camden Research UK being in the top 75 family business leaders in 2019. And to top it all off, to top it all off, this is the way to do it, for 2020 in February of this year, being in the top 100 list for Forbes Middle East top power business women 2020. So on that note, congratulations and welcome to the show. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much, Reg. It's my pleasure. I'm, I'm really excited about the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, really, it's great to have you here as well. I mean, it's rare, as you know, when it comes to women in leadership, there is a very small percentage, especially in the corporate world, uh, that get to senior positions. I'm glad to see that there's more in family businesses now. So for me, it's a real honor because in the last few months, you're the second person I've had a chance to interview with your type of accolades. The other lady, if anyone wants to get a chance to watch her videos, Rapalang uh, Rabana from Africa, who was also on the Forbes Africa list. So tell me, you know, when it comes to women in leadership, and especially for young ladies out there, you know, who, whether in a family business or not, what would be some of your advice and tips for a young lady thinking about her future, her career, college, university, future? You know, what, what are some of the things that you could share based on your experiences? Sure. So uh, women empowerment is a topic that's really close to my heart. And uh, one of the reasons for that is like in, in my family, like uh, I, I saw that my dad always gave a lot of attention to me and I was always given a free hand in terms of like choosing whatever I wanted to do in life. Mm -hmm. So that was really motivational for me. And I've often seen that uh, sometimes women don't have enough role models and that causes uh, a lot of difficulties in reaching to the top. And mm -hmm. like this, this concept of having mentors or a life coach or things like that actually right. helps speed up the process of getting to the top. So I think these days people are getting more and more role models and that's uh, sort of helping women to uh, get to the top. And I, I'm happy uh, that I've been recognized by all these lists. And I think it's my moral duty to actually give back uh, to the society and to reach out to young women. And so I'm mentoring quite a lot of uh, young students and uh, like uh, girls who would like to go into medicine or who would like to switch careers because I'm a doctor and then I switched into business. So that's sort of a, of a niche. So I'm doing my part, but I, I'm sure like uh, with, the, with the times to come, there'll be more attention to women. And there's one more thing that we are very uh, particular about. We, we really want to have more women on board and that's an important topic. And it's, it's So again, can I ask you then, if you are, you know, someone out there based on your advice says, okay, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a young lady here. I'm thinking about my future. I need a, a really good 
female mentor role model, what, what advice would you give them apart from ringing up yourself? And I'm sure you've got a long list of people who, who you know, are always talking to you, but what, what, how do you go and find that mentor? Where do you go? Sure. Uh, so I, I always suggest like uh, uh, the young girls and, and everybody, in fact, like whatever you want, just go and get it. Like you don't, you get in life only things that you ask for. That's a quote by Oprah Winfrey. Mm -hmm. You get in life only things that you have the courage to ask for. So it's just like even on LinkedIn, you can just randomly reach out to people. And the worst answer that you'd get is a no, right? Like there's nothing more to, to lose out there. Right. So I would I would really suggest like all of these people, like if you actually find a role model and if you really admire somebody who, who you'd like uh, to be your mentor, you could actually, you should actually just reach out to her, mm -hmm. find mutual connections and, and uh, try to uh, like, uh, send her emails and all, and and the worst answer that you would get is a no. That's that's still okay, right? Like mm -hmm. at least like she knows that like you really admire her and all, and oftentimes you really don't get a no. Like you get some sort of support, and and the lady would maybe delegate the task. To yeah, I I, I tend to agree with you because I think that the more successful you are, it can be lonely. It's you know people have this false thing that they're oh that person's going to be so busy they won't have time for me they're so successful in reality that person yeah is busy but they are thinking when is someone going to call me and ask me for my for my help <laughs> you know have you ever found that no that's actually very true so so when i and even when i look at my dad initially like uh, when you when you're much junior you're actually so busy you have your calendar scheduled with every 30 minutes meetings and all you don't actually have time to think right but later on, as you as you progress in your life, you have more time for yourself. You have more time to actually just just free your schedule and think about things. And those are the times where people actually reflect back upon their lives and they're happy to help other people as well, because that gives a sense of satisfaction to these people as well. Exactly. So there's our first tip um, with you, which is make sure that you go and get yourself a, a mentor. Don't uh, hold back. Ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. And, and what's the worst thing that can happen? It's a no for now, okay? It's a no for now and maybe move on. As someone told me many, many years ago, the three SW, some will, some won't, so what? Okay, next. So, so one thing you mentioned there was about going from the transition of being a doctor. Yeah, and that's, a, that's a huge investment. You went to Stanford, did your MBA there as well, became a doctor after that and uh, went back and obviously with the innovation and other social things that you did. But... Is that a good thing? I mean, what's your suggestion? Is it about getting it right from day one and follow the right path and keep going? Or is it okay to change? I mean, and I'd love to know your story of what made you go from being a doctor then saying, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to be a serial entrepreneur. Forget this. Well, tell us about that story and, and what advice you've got for people around changing things and, you know, sure. in your career. I think like the world is moving so fast. Everything's like, there's so much innovation happening, new disciplines that are coming out like AI, ML and all these things didn't even exist back, back then, right? So if you are really passionate about something, there's, there's no harm in actually switching your career. So the story about me was that my, my, both of my parents were doctors. So as I was born and raised in Libya, my, my parents were doctors there. And then when the Libyan sanctions happened, we moved to Dubai. So I did part of my schooling from Libya, part of it from Dubai. And then I went to medical college in India. And the reason for going to medical college back then was because my, my dad was a doctor when I was growing up and I saw the huge amount of respect that he used to get from his patients and, mm -hmm. and all of that, the, the Libyan locals. So that was ingrained in my mind and I really wanted to be like him. So that was the reason I went to medical college. But at medical college, I uh, got a very good professor who was my mentor and he helped me out in, in terms of like, um, innovating and working on medical devices. So I was actually publishing a lot of papers, presenting a lot of papers. Right. I was the first student of my university to get a travel grant to go abroad and present papers. I was really excited and uh, on the top of my game. But when I came back uh, to India and I wanted to commercialize these devices, I reached out to the professor, but he didn't know anything about the language of business. And even the best of professors in medical colleges back then didn't know anything about business. Like they would be happy with getting like one more paper published in a peer reviewed journal because they are like so much like an academician. So, so can that's I what- you, Richie, just for a sec, sorry to interrupt you. Um, can I ask you, you know, normally with parents, you get conditions. So, you know, you've got two doctors in, in the house, you know, here you arrive and they both go, doctor, okay? <laughs> it's like, it's like an automatic conditioning. So then when you told them that you wanted to move into other areas, yeah, 
and we'll talk about Dana Group where you're obviously actively involved, but not in the normal sense where someone goes, right, I'm going to join the legacy business and I will become the automatic successor. You've got a really good hybrid model going on with, with your parents where you know, you're doing the things that you want to do, but still involved in the core business. So when you told them, look, I don't want to be a doctor, I'm moving into tech and other things, what, how did that go down with them? That for, for my case, that actually went very well because my dad had himself switched from being a doctor to an entrepreneur. Ah, so when the, there you go. Okay. <laughs> when yeah. the Libyan sanctions had happened, he moved to Dubai because whenever we used to go to Libya, there was always a transit through Dubai and he saw like Dubai was really growing up. And back then, Libya was a closed economy. So he started up with a, a general trading company here in Dubai. So that was his start. So when I wanted to enter the, the line of business, he was really excited and he, he motivated me to actually apply to the best of business schools. But otherwise, I wouldn't have even applied to Stanford and MIT. But I was lucky that I got into like almost all the B schools that I applied to. I actually got a full scholarship from MIT. But my dad said that whatever your, your heart wants, so I chose Stanford because of the focus on entrepreneurship. Mm. And I think that that was a good decision. Do you think with what's happened in 2020 with the, the global crisis pandemic and you know, over a billion children not going to school for six months. And it's going to be longer now in some countries. What, what is your thoughts on education? Uh, what's going to happen in the future? Is it still about, you know, going to universities? Is it still about doing your MBA and going to Ivy League schools? Or do you see this whole model changing? Yeah, I can I can see a huge shift in edtech because of online learning. And even before that, back back in 2011, 2012, when the Khan Academy had started, things were already trying to move online. But this uh, the COVID crisis had actually just uh, like uh, expedited the way for online learning. Mm -hmm. And there were a few TED talks back then which said that anybody can become an expert. With just you just have to put like 20 hours of hard work and you can become an expert. And I, that's a, that, that was a very eye-opening talk for me. So that's, that's how I, like, you, you can see that I, I have a couple of patents on AI in robotic surgery. That's, that's not my domain. But the reason that I could do that was I put in some, some hard work and like to shift from doctor to business and all of these things. Like, mm -hmm. There's no shortcut to success. It's all about hard work. So like with the help of online learning, anybody sitting anywhere who has access to internet and a good uh, laptop can actually learn like whatever he wants to learn. And yeah. these days, like for the future, I think remote working would be a good trend. Mm -hmm. So they don't actually want to like need to go to universities to get degrees and all. You can actually start your own like side hustle from the very beginning and then maybe take it up later on. Yeah, I like that. I like that approach. So, so you know, going back to the whole educational uh, thing right now, uh, there's a lot of people who are highly educated. Okay, they've been to the best uh, universities, best business schools in the world, but it doesn't guarantee success, does it? No, it doesn't. There's a lot of people out there are unemployed and yeah. struggling, and yet, uh, whether they, they took a loan out or whether their parents paid for it, they paid a fortune, whichever way, for that education. And, and we all know in America right now how big that debt is, the loan, student loan uh, debt, yeah, yeah. where people can't even pay it back. So, so putting, putting education to one side of going to university business school, what are the other ingredients, even if you didn't go there, you yeah. know, that you need to be successful? Sure. So when, when me or my brother, we said that, we say that we are, oh, I'm an MBA from Stanford, and all my dad famously says that, I'm an MBA from the States. And what he says quickly is actually streets. So he is an, he is an MBA from the streets because he has, he has learned practically like all the, he has have three shops here in the bazaar. Like he knows like how to like negotiate with somebody, how to like buy new things and like- The so real streetwise, streetwise exactly. uh, skills, yeah. And those are really important skills. And, and like whenever like me or my brother, we were learning under him and like trying out our first, composing our first emails to our suppliers, he would always say, if you, say, if you send this email, you'd get this reply. But if you say the same things in a different way, you'll get a different reply. And those things really help. Like you, you never get taught those things in, in a proper B school. So being streetwise is one. What, what other traits, attributes, skills would you say are important, which you're not going to learn at university or business school to be successful? I think networking is another thing that's really important for a person's success. And it's important to actually just show up for, for any meeting or any meetups that you're really interested in. 
it's really important to just just show up because like half the work is done there because once you show up the, the actual inertia of getting out of the home and and putting you out, putting yourself out there is already done so the next step is just to exchange business cards and all and that's particularly an easy step so networking actually helps in many many ways you never know like the, the power of a network of the the person that you just met maybe you'll, you'll start a new business later on and that person could actually help you out in making some connections or maybe become a seed investor in your company Mm-hmm. So networking is really important. Apart from that, I think there's there's not no real shortcut. It comes to hard work. So you have to put in the hard work. You have to like do do the groundwork. So That's street really- being streetwise, be great at networking. Put in the hard work. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's it. You'll be successful. Yeah. Or is there anything else missing? <laughs> what else? I. I think I think that's it because I I don't I don't think like intelligence or anything has any meaning because once I once I saw that TED talk about like anybody can become an expert in twenty hours I it really changed my life I I think I think about things in a completely different way. Is that is that twenty hour thing linked to a bit like the tipping point on Malcolm Gladwell's thing as well about the ten thousand hour rules yeah where you know if someone puts in five hours a day over twenty years they could be in the top 3% of their profession in the world. But if you yeah. find a mentor, you could half that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Is, it, is it similar to, to, to yeah. that type of thinking? Yeah, it, it's sort of similar to that. But like in, in that one, there was, uh, there was no thought about mentors, it's about putting in your own hard work. But, but I believe uh, in the power of mentors and having like a life coach or somebody like a CEO coach sort of thing, because these are people who have done the wrong things themselves. They have learned from the mistakes and they're ready to like give out all the learnings to you in one go. So that really helps in That's brilliant. a very massive way. So, so tell me, um, when, when you were growing up with your brother, and your brother is, sorry, older or younger? He's two years older to me. Okay, great. Even better. So, you know, in, 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 our, in our cultures in Africa, Middle East and Asia, you know, we all know what it's like with, with having an elder brother if, if, you're, if you're a female. So, you know, what, what, I'm, I'm just being direct here because I've got a younger sister who's four years younger than me. And I know what it was like for her growing up, you know, in our household with our parents. And, you know, I would always be the favoured one with my mum. You know, I'd always be pampered. And uh, this had a real impact on her growing up, you know. Now, I... And, and sometimes it could go the wrong way where uh, one could have a lot of issues and not come out of that, affects self-esteem, confidence. What, and in other cases, someone's really strong, they'll use that as an anchor to do great things in their life, which is exactly what my sister did. You know, she's a serial entrepreneur doing amazing things, and I'm so proud of her. But I remember those few years where there were some challenges because of the way my parents were treating me. What are your thoughts around that? Did you go through any, anything like that? I, I remember like one, one particular story that comes to my mind and it's repeated in, in, in our in like day-to-day lives many times. People give this, like my dad gives this anecdote. So what happened was uh, when I was in my 10th standard, you know, like the, the board exams are really important, especially for, for Indian parents. It's like, like really important. And my dad was in Dubai and me and my brother were in India with my mom. So my dad uh, didn't actually meet us very often, but he used to call before the exams and said, and so this one time when I was just about to give my board exams, he said the the 10th board exams are really important. They would stay on your CV forever and this and that and and all of that. Um, Just just perform like Ankur. So Ankur is my elder brother. So immediately I don't, I didn't even think about things, but like the reflex thing that came out of my mouth back then was like, uh, can't I do better than Ankur? So, so that was something that, that stuck and I actually performed better than him and, and uh, people like we, we all joke about it nowadays and so similarly like later on when I was going for an MBA that's, that's again when my dad remembered those things and said like, do better than Ankur. <laughs> so that's I think uh, that has actually changed uh, quite a lot in, in terms of like our, our family dynamics as well because like uh, it was a turning point in terms of because my, my brother always used to come like first or second in his class and I, I never ranked anywhere in my, in my studies like all through childhood wow. but that was a turning point where where I performed better and, and like subsequently after that. So was, was there like, a bit of you know sibling competition at all would you say was, was there a bit of was that there is that still no, there? No that's that's not all there because he he's a doctor himself and he got into medical college in the first attempt 
So I always looked up to him and I also got into medical college in the first attempt. So it was like uh, really good and it was really good to have his support all through because medical college studies can be really tough. So he was always there to support me and, and like we, we are the best of friends and uh, like Lovely. even our spouses know about that. <laughs> Love it, love it. And, and what about values? Because I think, you know, one of the things I speak a lot about with, the, with family businesses around the world is values. Um, yeah. So growing up, what, what would you say, where did you get influence from parents on, on what your values are, traditions, you know, rituals, uh, you know, the DNA of the family and growing up, it's still with you today. What would be some of those things? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good question. So Back when we were in Libya, I, I really enjoyed the time that I spent with my parents because my parents were working back then. They were not like entrepreneurs. They were not running the family business. So they, they used to have their weekends and, and uh, they used to spend time with us. So that was really important. And uh, my dad used to teach us quite a lot of things back then, like from uh, the holy books that we have in, in India. So he used to teach those lessons and also that was really good. And uh, back in the ni early 90s, when my dad started his general trading business, he used to trade almost anything. So he started off with med medical equipment trading because that's something that he understood. But Libya was such a closed economy that like uh, people used to demand like all sorts of goods and he used to supply each and everything. But back then he had set some ground rules that he would never like do any business in like cigarettes or alcohol. Those were his rules. Yeah. And yeah. the reason for that is because he he's a doctor. Like we are all doctors. We have taken the Hippocratic uh, oath, and that really matters a lot for us. So so till now, like in in our family business, we still have a general trading division, and we trade almost everything. But we never trade like alcohol or cigarettes. We don't even touch them. Yeah. Even in terms of startups, I I, think, I see a lot of e-cigarette startups are really booming, but we 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 stay away. From so this it. is what I I refer to as, and for those who are watching this, I refer to it as almost like family codes you know, or your guiding principles where it's an agreement, isn't it? To say, okay, this is, you know, I've worked with families out there where they won't go into, let's say the leather business or anything uh, connected to with animals. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's no right or wrong. It's just about what you've agreed as a family, isn't it? And then sticking to that. Um, okay. And then outside of that, when it came to the, the, the family business now talking about, going from Libya, you know, expanding into the UAE. Tell us about Dana Group and because it's not just one, it's a conglomerate. Yeah, you've, you've built, how many, how many businesses are there now in, in, in the group? So we have seven factories here in UAE and we have some operations in uh, like Africa and in Asia as well. Yeah. So I'll start off with uh, like, back when the Libyan sanctions happened, my, my dad wanted to move away from Libya and, and Dubai was one of the places that he knew a little bit because we always used to transit through Dubai. So he started uh, with a small shop in Murshid Bazaar, that's the, the general trading market here in, in Dubai. So he started off with trading of medical equipments because he had a lot of uh, clients from Libya who were his patients back then. But since he has he had become the head of department of surgery, he had a lot of goodwill as well. And my mom was a gynecologist, so she used to deliver a lot of local babies back, back then. So, so my parents had a lot of goodwill. Mm -hmm. So when my dad started his business, he started off with just supplying goods to Libya because Libya was a closed economy. And uh, like that's how he started. So he used to like trade almost everything. Eventually, we had three shops in Murshid Bazaar. And one of the main things that he used to supply to Libya was water heaters. Water heaters are the geysers that help you like heat the water in the in the summer, in the winter months. So he was buying almost 80% of uh, the production of a factory here in Ajman. So he thought that uh, it's better to just acquire it. So that's how we entered into manufacturing. And one of the main raw materials for water heaters is steel. So he used to like import steel and then he used to import a little bit of extra steel and supply to the local market. Excellent. And eventually we, we set up like a coil service center. So now we have seven coil service centers. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's in the, in the steel division. And apart from that, we have a steel mill. We manufacture value added end products of steel, like sandwich panels, profiles, cable trays and all. And apart from that, we also acquired some distressed assets back in uh, 2009 after the crisis because we were cash rich back then. And so those assets have actually helped us expand quite a lot. So we entered into oil and gas, we entered into real estate, retail. Mm -hmm. So these are things that we have in UAE. In India, we have a hospital that's uh, in our name. So we 
uh, it carries our name, but we, we get like a rent and a profit share. We're not involved in day-to-day -day operations. It's a good group of doctors who are handling the operations. So it has a very good goodwill. And it's, it's at a place that my dad bought back in the 80s because he had his dream of setting up a hospital. That was, Those were his ambitions back okay. then when he was a doctor. Right. And what a great story. And there's still more, isn't it? Go on, please yeah. carry on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and in India we have a couple of hotels and some warehouse complexes. And uh, apart from that, in, in other countries, we have appointed distributors for most of our goods. So that, that makes the job easier. An impressive story. And I know whether it's your father or whether it's you with Forbes, you know, you're always showing up on, on the rich lists and everything else. I mean, what, what's that like? Is it, do you, are you overwhelmed with that? Or is it like, oh, don't, you know, it's just another list. Um, you know, how do, how do you stay grounded when you know, you know, you're, you're a wealthy family, you're successful, you employ thousands of people, you know, you've got businesses around the world. How, how does one stay grounded? Yeah, so, so we are a very, very hardworking family, as, as you correctly give this example that the first generation is the most hardworking. So somehow in, in, in our case, even the second generation is little bit of hard working so we are so uh, like busy in our day-to-day -day lives and all like even on the fridays our, our dad uh, takes us around to the factories we see all the factories we distribute breakfast and all to the to the workers who are working overtime and all so it's like uh, there was no other life apart from the family business so it's recently that we uh, that we started to get on these lists. So there's just one social evening that we have every year. That's the Forbes dinner. Right. But apart from that, we don't have much of a social life. And it, it really gets lonely um, at, at this point of time. So recently what happened was that since our, most of our operations are doing well, we have general managers to take care of things. I sort of like uh, thought of actually going out and networking a little bit and understand like what are other people in similar shoes doing? Like are they investing in other assets? Which sort of assets are they investing in? Should we set up a family office? So those were the things that came to my mind. And it's just from last year onwards that I've been speaking at some events and like going out and meeting people from different, like globally, just, just meeting people and seeing like what are other people doing, enjoying your course and, and seeing like what, what are the lessons that we should learn. So that's how, like, we we are trying to uh, understand, like, what's the next step for us? Because now and I wanted to acknowledge you for that, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of people, you know, in a similar uh, similar stage with, with as a family business as as you are, and their ego gets in the way. You know, and I really want to acknowledge you because whether it's you know through our academy, our events that we've done and forums, you're always you're right at the front of the queue. You know, you're always wanting to learn wanting to network and and your ego doesn't get in the way and i love that about you know what how you operate and how you do things i just wanted to acknowledge you on that and and and, and i hope others can learn from that which is park your ego doesn't matter about status and significance and how powerful you are you know you're still a human being and you can still be surrounded with other people at different levels in their life and rub shoulders and and learn you know so yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that the important thing there is to learn from other people. Like, just see what other people are doing. What what's their day to day life like? Are they investing in some some other assets? And there's this a thing called FOMO that that uh, the fear of missing out. That concept came to me at Stanford because there were so many things going on, and like you always have this fear of okay, I I lost, uh, I'm losing up on this thing. So again, like just, just meeting people and, and learning from them actually helps you uh, understand things like how are other industries performing? What are, what are things that are important? to? So consider? can I ask you, you know, with, with thanks for sharing about Dharma Group yeah. and where you're at today. So when you, what was your first steps of joining the family business? How did that work of, of joining what you did? Were there any rules in place? Was there clarity? Was there confusion? You know, what, what, what was that entry point? Could you talk us through and how that's evolved? Sure. So back in uh, 2008, that's, that's when I completed my uh, medicine from, from India. And I came to Dubai to actually present a paper. And my brother was two years older to me, so he had already joined the business. So my dad just asked this uh, question that, if you and your brother, like, if they stay in the business, I'll expand. Otherwise, I'll just consult it. So that's a, a common question that most of the parents ask, right? So, so back then, I, I thought about it for a bit because I, I really wanted to, like, do something in medical devices. And that was uh, where my passion lied. 
and I thought that to, to learn the language of business and all, I think it would be a good experience to actually uh, be a part of the family business where we start a new division. So that's how I started. So it was like uh, starting a, a completely new division and it was sort of my pet project back then. So I was working on like uh, designing a new catalog for the new products that we would be selling and all of that. So it was a very slow process. I was taking my time. There was no sense of urgency. Yes. But when the crisis hit in, in late 2008, that's when uh, actually my division helped quite a lot in terms of like uh, helping us sustain ourselves as well. Because what, what happened in 2008 was that the steel prices had fell by almost 50%. Mm -hmm. And we had goods that were being shipped from China, from other countries. There were goods that were in the high seas. There were a lot of goods that were stuck here in DP, DP world because that's the Jabal Ali port. Because like all the containers came in and nobody was releasing the containers because and damage was coming up and all of it. So there was these all issues. And since the steel prices had fallen by 50% and you're not um, doing anything about it, it could actually crash the entire business. A lot of people had uh, like winded up their businesses back then. Right. So what, what our division of value added steel helped us was that it's value added things are no longer a commodity. Like I can give you an example of a yarn and a shirt the price of the yarn could fluctuate with the market conditions, but the price of a shirt would, would be the same, right? Mm -hmm. So value added steel is something like that. So when uh, so back then I, I had actually got the vendor approval from various oil field clients. Like I used to go to Buruj, Takri, Radnock, PDO in Oman and all. So we had these approvals in place and that actually helped us uh, sustain the crisis because we would sell the finished products at a premium. And even though the, the steel prices had fallen, but that would, didn't affect us quite much. So that was the entry. It was slow, but like with the crisis, I'd actually taken up the responsibility. So can I ask you, because obviously you, you, you created essentially what I refer to as a regeneration path for the family. Okay. Mm -hmm. But so while you're building that new business unit, were you still getting involved in overseeing or understanding the rest of the businesses? Because, you know, I talk a lot about that in our, in our, uh, programs when we're, we're working with family businesses, which is, you know, a, a next gen member can spin off something you do what they're passionate about, but allow them still to be observers of the legacy business because at some point they they will become the successor. That legacy still needs to continue, so a board position would be important. And I know you've done all of this, so you know, yeah. were you involved heavily in all the other businesses as well at the early stage or or not? Very much. In fact, uh, like one of the things that we do is like we always like sit. Uh, we even used to have like a lunch dinner together. Back then we were not married, so we used to all live together, and like we would used to discuss each and every matter. Like there was no other discussion apart from the family business. I think that's uh, one of the cons of being in a family business. You don't actually get to talk about anything else. You don't have your own passions and all because you're so busy and it's your, like your own baby. It's like this concept of stewardship that you take ahead right so that was really good back then and uh, what eventually happened was that i oversaw a lot of things like when when we got the vendor approvals eventually we got the orders and these orders from the oil field lines they always have uh, an ld that's like penalty if you don't deliver the goods on time so eventually what happened was that i used to wear my safety shoes and go to the factory and sit there for the entire day and see what's going on, how many uh, things are the other workers manufacturing, if they're manufacturing these many in this, this much time, they should be manufacturing these many when I'm not around. So these were small, small things. When you start a new division, it's really important, but eventually like there are people to take care of things. But like me, my brother, uh, we have done all the hard work ourselves. We, we know each and, what, and every what, what were some? What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced during that period to be able to do those things? Yeah, I think production challenges are really important. In, 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 in manufacturing, that was a very big challenge because we didn't want to actually pay any uh, like penalties because of late deliveries. And uh, getting the vendor approval was, was a challenge. I, I used to go up to the consultants and get the sample board submitted and all of that. So I've done all of that. But like once the orders came, that was a really high point. But like to deal with the production was a nightmare. That what, about with people? what about with people? Because sometimes... Being a sure. next gen member, and I've seen this in other family businesses, and being a female next gen member, being in a male dominated environment, especially when you've got people who've been there a long time, uh, you know, senior management that may have been working with your father for a long time. How do you, you know, how, how does one handle those situations? 
yeah, that was a challenge. But uh, the good thing was that since I was ready to, there was no metro back, back then. I didn't have, even have a driving license, but I used to take the bus to actually go, go to our factory every day for, I think, almost a month. So since people saw that I was putting in so much of hard work, so they actually acknowledged it and they actually helped me. And so I came up with some new initiatives like Lean Idea of the Month and Employee of the Month. These were things that didn't exist back then in our, in our company. But because of these initiatives, everybody was motivated to do further. And I think just seeing the, the amount of hard work that I was putting in, like I was having tea with, with every, everybody out there. So, so that made me more like part of the family and it wasn't a challenge anymore. It's only like if you distance yourself from, from these people and you just like push your orders on them, then it becomes a challenge. But if you become a part of them and you get their buy-in through various uh, strategies, then it really helps you out in the long term. Love it. And Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about some of the other ventures. I think, I think if I've got it right, uh, Duluth Medical Technology, there's a, a Jugart, I think, and then there's a Fund RX. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you've been involved in. Could you talk us through some of those ventures and what's been the learnings or has there been any mistakes? You know, what's worked, what hasn't worked? Yeah. So this is, uh, all of this started when I went to Stanford. That the startup bug just, just bites you and, and you're like, because everywhere you go, every coffee shop that you go to, everybody's pitching an idea and there's a VC on the other side that's listening to it and it gets really exciting. So back when I was at Stanford, I started my own venture of crowdfunding that was called Pico Venture. And like it got a lot of media attention and all of that and things were really good. But eventually like the rules in India, they never uh, turned out to be favorable for such a thing. So we never actually uh, launched the equity crowdfunding part of it because there was a Sahara case that happened and I didn't want to get into all of that mess. So it, it remains as a landing page right now. And like we... So what, was the, what, was the learning, what was the learning with your first venture then? Uh, looking back now, if you were doing that all over again, but with your experience now, what, what would you have done differently? Yeah, I think the, the main learning back uh, then was that uh, to just like see what are, where are the regulations moving? Do you have any control about such things? Because there are things that are out of your control. You cannot do much about it. But the best part about uh, that venture back then was that uh, like uh, there was no expense attached to it. There was only a website. There was no, no other expense. It was just me who was, who was managing the entire thing. We didn't even register a company for that back then. So, so that, these were the quick learnings that I got because it was more of an MVP. But the kind of media attention that it got, it actually helped me understand that this is something that I can do. It gave me the confidence to actually do it. Great. Love that. And then what was the next one outside of the family business? What was the next venture? So the next venture was Jugard. So that, that again, that was in, in the UAE. So that was like a, a, a logistics delivery service that we started here. And uh, so that was actually the first company to get an RT approval from the government here for e-health services, like, you know, like Kareem and, on, and all of that for actually doing food delivery and all. So you can... You, you so for those who are listening now from other parts of the world... It's, you know, it's similar to, I suppose, other delivery brands, but we've got, we've also got, uh, like Uber, we've got a Kareem brand in the UAE. So just, just yeah. letting everyone know in case they've never heard of, of Kareem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead, so, please. Yeah. So for this one, uh, it was a, was a, was an expensive mistake actually, because like we, uh, like got put in some of our money, we actually got an angel investor to put in some money as well. But eventually what happened was that uh, like uh, the government here in UAE, they, they asked for a bid bond mm -hmm. and it was more than the amount that we had already invested in the company. And that, uh, that would be like a security that would stay with the government for, uh, for almost ever. Right. So that's something that even we were not comfortable doing. And even the investor wasn't very comfortable because that would be like, uh, it would just affect the entire liquidity of the startup. So what we did was we got the approvals, uh, everything was in place, but we, we never really actually launched the stuff. So that was a, that was a, another learning about the regulations and like you, you should do things in which you have much more control about. Yeah. But this was something that we knew only like after getting the approval, that's when the government said, okay, this is the amount that we want for having you do it. On, on the it. And then, and then recently you, you, a medical tech business. Yeah. Yeah? So that is really exciting. I, I'm still a part of it. So, uh, I, I don't know any mistakes as of now, but like uh, I'm very passionate about it. So this is what um, is there in the valley, in the Silicon Valley. So um, the current CEO of this company, Duluth Medical, he 
was a guest professor at Stanford and he's already sold five medtech companies in the past and this was his sixth venture. And since I was uh, one of the doctors in the MBA class, there were only three doctors. Mm -hmm. So he stayed in touch and when he was starting something for the emerging countries, he reached out to me and I got really excited and my, my family was also very excited because we have a hospital in India and uh, like we are a family of doctors. So we all have our own networks mm -hmm. in terms of due diligence and all it could help us quite a lot. So we finally we decided to invest and I'm on the board of the company and I'm also helping them out actively in terms of getting data and also it's a robotic surgery company. Oh, wow. and I love that. that is the future, isn't it? For sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when we look at our family business, oftentimes we have this discussion in our house that our business is almost like a Titanic. It's moving in one direction, but you don't know like what, where would be the next innovation that would be coming from because we are into steel and oil. These are like, um, industries in which there's not much innovation happening but we are all all the time afraid of what would happen what like what's the next new thing and all so since healthcare was something that we understood and we understood like robotic surgery is the future and this was low cost robotic surgery mm -hmm. so we understood that this would this would have a huge market here in the middle east in asia and in africa as well so we decided to get into it and apart from that we are also on the lookout of other startups Mm. And uh, mainly we invest just in healthcare startups, but now we're thinking to invest in some VC funds as well, because uh, there, there are a lot of good opportunities that come across, but we, we don't have the bandwidth to actually. And would that be, when you look at those ventures, is there a criteria that you have in mind or does it need to fit within the existing ecosystem of businesses that you've got? Yeah, so till now, like uh, in terms of uh, distress assets, it's mainly about the industries that we are keen about. So, but like uh, when we enter into a new industries, if we get, if we get a sick unit and we get like uh, some sort of background about the unit and some sort of workers or, or senior management who can actually run the unit, we actually take that deal. In terms of startups, it's mainly about healthcare because that's what we understand. And if there are new startups in other other domains, uh, right now we are thinking it's better to actually make investment into uh, a fund like a VC fund because they know their, their business better than what we could do, right? So that's something we are still thinking about because in this crisis, we, we made some investments, um, but we are looking for more investments because only when um, like crisis brings about opportunities. So our reason for like rapid growth in 2009 was when we, acquire these distressed assets. So this time around also we're looking for some distressed assets or, or startups and all, but um, this time it's still uncertain. We don't, we don't see an end part for COVID-19. So things are still a little bit uncertain. Yeah, I well, I think you've got the right strategy. And I wrote an article about this just recently where it is based on someone I had interviewed where the, some of the, the, the significant results can come from a recession or a crisis for as long as you've got the cash or you've got access to cash, you know, it's a great time to acquire assets. So when it comes to structure of, of the family group, have you professionalized all aspects of all, all the businesses now and have purely a board role or does your father and you and your brother, does everyone still have some sort of finger in the pie day to day or how's it work in terms of your structure? So I was uh, like very much in the operations till uh, June last year, and but but recently me and my dad we we try to like just oversee operations and I try to see like investment opportunities and my dad is like more like uh, thinking about strategies about where which domains to invest into geographies and also but my brother is still involved in day to day operations. We have general managers of various units, but they report to my brother and he's. Like by the end of the day, he's like totally uh, drained out and, and, and he really wants um, me and, and my dad to look into startups and all of those things. But he himself doesn't have the time to actually do it. So, so that's what well, it's, all, it's all about. You know, they, these are options. There's, there's choices there. And, and, and again, for those who are watching this from a family business advisory perspective, there's going to be some family members who are great for being involved in operations day to day and they love it. It's perfect fit for them. There's others where that will drive them mad after a while and, and they have to be more strategic or on the business with projects. And then there's others, I've seen it a lot with senior members who reach a point where if everything's professionalized, they set up the family office and they're purely looking at investment deals and that's what gives them a buzz. And uh, that becomes part of a regeneration path. So I think you're touching 
you know, all of those three areas right now as you're going through your transition. But one of the biggest things is, you know, shifting to the third generation, you know, in the right way. And this is where, when you were talking about uh, meetings around the lunch table, dinner table, it's all about business. I've seen this so many times with first and second generation businesses, and that's what made them successful. But as the family maybe becomes bigger and you're thinking third gen, that balance has to be right with family and business. So what are your thoughts on addressing that as you think about third generation? Yeah. And apart from like the family business, I, we like just, yes, just day before yesterday on Friday, we were all together and we were discussing about like, what's the future of our business. So we were, as a family, we were realizing that this is like steel, oil, like hard assets. These would remain, but like the future is tech and startups and also like the business itself would move in a particular direction. So we are still uncertain about what would happen in the, in the near future. But as of now, our, like the third generation is very young. Like my daughter is two and a half years old. My brother has uh, two sons. They're like uh, six and two years old. Yes. So they're still young. But uh, like since we are very hardworking, I think like we'll, we'll try to make our children adapt to, to the same lifestyle. But we're still not sure. But again, there's, there's also a lot of pressure that comes uh, with the education that we have had, right? Mm. Like, should we like because I went to Stanford, I'm a doctor, so it's really difficult to actually, uh, and I interview uh, undergraduate students for the Stanford admissions. So mm -hmm. I see like what sort of difference parenthood plays in various children's lives. And that's, that's something that I am I'm also writing an article about it, how mental well-being and, and like COVID-19 is actually affecting the lives of children because mm -hmm. they're not meeting people, they're not socializing outside. Mm -hmm. And, and in itself, like, um, if, if the mothers are working and all, they don't pay enough attention to the, to the children. And oftentimes then, then that actually derails the entire life of the kid. Yeah. This is something that I'm, I'm still working on, but I'm like, like that's great. Well, it, it is work in progress. And I think, you know, from what I've witnessed with families over the years is the six year old that you mentioned, who's the eldest out of the three right now is, yeah. is the best time. Because if, 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 if the next generation get a chance to walk around the manufacturing plant, see what's going on, see the, your new robotic healthcare engineering stuff, what's going on, you know, they, they're part of that. Or they get, you know, I've been through it where youngsters are sitting in meetings as observers. Uh, I remember when my, my youngest son was a little boy, you know, eight, nine years of age, and I picked him up from school and I said, look, I'm taking you to a meeting today. And uh, he went to his first ever meeting, it was a Kapinski Hotel, the Mall of the Emirates in Dubai, and uh, at the end of that meeting, he said, uh, next time, can I, can I get cards? <laughs> you know? and, and before you know it, the next meeting, he wanted a notepad. So these little things uh, can have a huge impact on children. And I believe, uh, based on our research, if they're occupied with school and activities, uh, going abroad, and they don't have the opportunity to be part of the business, to yeah. learn, observe, feel it, touch it, smell it you almost lose them for the family business for the future then especially and no disrespect to anyone who studied in uk or america but the culture if you're there long enough the culture is also different to africa middle east and south asia yeah. you know one can develop an individualistic mindset uh, versus typically our culture in this part of the world but what are your thoughts around any of those things that i've said <laughs> No, that's that's actually uh, very interesting because like when when I was at Stanford, uh, like uh, my parents came for the graduation and I didn't want to come back to Dubai. <laughs> I, was, I was really happy there. And um, because I, I was interested in medical devices and all of that and most of the innovation was happening there in the valley. But eventually like uh, and like my brother also came and, and he spoke to me so that that actually changed my mindset and made me join the, the business. But otherwise, like if, if I would have followed that part, that would have been the individualistic part that you mentioned. And that's very, very easy for, uh, for children to do because it's, it's, you, you have your friends there, your entire network is there, you've made your new friends and, and you want to live your life there. But I think it's important to actually stay in touch with the family and like um, understand like what, what are the challenges they're facing. Because, Oftentimes, interest in, in a family business comes when you actually try to solve a problem for the family. Like if there's a challenge and you're able to give something of your own to actually solve the challenge, that actually makes you 
be more involved in the family business. So that's, that's what worked in, in our case. That's brilliant. So as, as we sort of come to a close, I was going to ask you when it comes to family business legacies, and you said you're already in discussions with family about what the future looks like, but at a real foundation level, regardless of what businesses you're in, what the numbers look like, what wealth looks like at a foundation level, what is important to you and your family for the future? What would you say that looks like to make sure the legacy does continue? Yeah, so as recently as uh, watching your webinar about uh, the UGRs, Unwritten Ground Rules. So yeah, with that, the two of our partners, and I'll mention who they are, Steph Duplessis and Steve Simpson. So, uh, yeah. you know, if anybody wants to watch the video on our channel, make sure you check those two guys out. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that was really interesting. And that made, made me think about our family business in that way. So what came to mind immediately was that for us, like we have a number of products and they carry our brand name Dana. And Dana is our surname, so we would never let uh, our products be of any inferior quality. Like excellence is key in terms of like selling the products in the market. So, like in in lubricants, we have other brands as well. Like we do OEM for other brands and all. But if we are doing our own brand, we would never like uh, like dip the prices or or uh, like uh, bring about wrong raw materials or anything like that because. It, it carries our name and that's really significant for us. But if, if there's a client that wants like a, a low priced or a recycled uh, sort of thing, then we, we are ready to do that, but in his name. So that's, I think that's what's important for us to, to carry our brand and to make sure that we, we are known for our quality. Yeah. So that's a key part, part, part of the DNA for the family. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and any other advice for again, young, young ladies, uh, women in business, women who are becoming entrepreneurs, you know, any other tips for them? I think again, I would like to say like you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. So it's, it's really important to uh, uh, actually ask for things because oftentimes as women, we, we feel that if we ask for things, we'll come across as bossy or, or something like that. But that's, that's not the case. If you, if you overthink things, then actually it, it can bring, bring about a harm as well. So it's really important to, to just go out there and then like show up for meetings, show up for everything that, that you want to do and have the courage to actually ask to network. I think that's really important. Brilliant. Brilliant. And if there was one thing that you'd like to achieve at a personal level in the next 10 years, yeah, let's say we're, we're, we're having a chat uh, at the end of uh, December, 2030, uh, what would be one key thing that's really important to you? in the next 10 years that you'd like to achieve, which is part of your aspirational or goal list? Yeah, I, like personally, I, I'm really passionate about having women on board and I think that trend is changing. Mm. So I would, uh, I'm already on the board of some startups, uh, a couple of corporates on, on some NGOs. In fact, I'm on the board of uh, University of California, uh, Chico as well, for one of the programs. So that's good, but I like personally, I'm working on actually getting on a board of maybe a public company or a big company. Maybe in ten years, I would love to do that because, like, there. So again, if it comes to role models, so if you look at like Intranoi and and the other role models that we had back in our lives, mm -hmm. so that's what they are doing now, right? So so after ten years, I think that that would be something that I would be really looking forward to do. And apart from that, I, I can see that the family business would be going on great and it would be like, I would like to ensure that it carries our name in a good way and the brand quality is not compromised. Love it. So I, I want to thank you for your time. Very inspirational. Uh, can't wait to share the video myself to, uh, to, with my daughter. So I'm going to make sure that she sees this ASAP. Uh, for those of you watching this, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, leave comments and go into the description area to find out more uh, about she's Dana's business and all the other startups she's involved in. We'll make sure that her personal details are there, her LinkedIn, and also the family business uh, website as well, okay? So you can find out more about their group of companies. And on that note, I wish you all the best and look forward to catching up soon and inviting you to a few uh, webinars in due course to sit on the panel and give some more uh, great inspiration to people. So thank you so much for today. Thank you so much, Reg. It was my absolute pleasure. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.